Kia and welcome. My name is Sarah. I'm the Community and Events Manager at Optimal Workshop. Um, thank you so much for joining us for a session of UX Insider. Um, I'll just give a few more minutes for people to, to log on, um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy days to, to join us today. Um, I'm going to uh, hand over now to our amazing speaker, Jennifer, to introduce herself, and we'll just crack right into this amazing topic. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so I'm here today to talk about uh, qualitative researchers and the value that you guys offer to business stakeholders. Um, my name is Jennifer, and I spent the last six years at an information architecture consulting firm in Seattle, and I got to work on a bunch of really cool UX and IA projects for really big enterprise clients, and um, our firm got to help them understand their users' mental models and create navigation structures and taxonomies. Uh, that were in support of the actual human beings that were using them. It was really cool. Um, while I was working there and during the pandemic, I also got an MBA, which allowed me to help the founders run the business side of the firm. And eventually I was kind of part of that executive leadership team. Um, I just got a new role as a faculty instructor at um, Western Washington University in their College of Business and Economics. And I'm going to run a data lab for a management information systems course. Um, this is actually going to be my first time teaching in an undergraduate setting, so I'm really thankful for this opportunity to get to practice here before classes start next week. Um, I should say a disclaimer that all of these opinions are my own and they're not affiliated with any employer, and I also did use AI a little bit to assist me in preparing for the talk. Okay, so based on my background, these are kind of the lenses through which I look at the world in a career context. I don't wanna downplay my own accomplishments. Uh, the world is really full of MBAs. It's quite literally the most popular graduate level degree. I'm one of more than 200,000 people who earned an MBA the year I graduated. Um, this is not a presentation where I'm gonna convince you of my worth or convince you to go back to school. Uh, the value of my education for me is not that it offered me any kind of inherent competitive advantage. Um, I just gained a lot of new skills that complemented my existing IA and UX design skill set. And I learned how to formulate new ways of talking about uh, the complexity of big business problems with business stakeholders. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about business school for a minute. So my MBA program was really very generalist. And these are the courses I took. And I took everything from supply chain management to finance and accounting, which I can tell you are two very different subjects um, now because I learned the language of each of those disciplines. And most of my coursework was really about learning the mental models and the language of these uh, cross-functional disciplines in order to communicate and solve problems across the, the business as a whole. Um, and I hope this resonates with researchers because a big part of research is familiarizing yourself with new domains and problem spaces. And um, thinking like a business person was kind of brand new to me before I got to business school. I actually had an arts undergrad. Um, but we really actually did have to do the work in these subjects. So we had to analyze corporate balance sheets, model this network of integrated technology systems. We had to unite business units with conflicting goals, to execute um, a marketing strategy on a really shoestring budget. Um, we had to assess the economic environment for project viability, and we had to mitigate risks, whether those were regulatory or political or financial. And immersing myself in this kind of cross-disciplinary work helped me have a lot of empathy for the decision makers in these business functions and to understand the interconnectedness of all of these systems. Um, we also had to perform some analysis of real companies um, using real case studies and a variety of frameworks and success metrics. So we talked about the pioneering strategy of Netflix as it was emerging. We talked about some really complex ethical dilemmas of companies like Nike and of De Beers. We talked so much about cars. I am done talking about cars, so much about cars. Um, lots of healthy disagreement discussions around really controversial products and their marketing challenges. Um, we compared companies at different stages of their corporate life cycles from emergent to dying. We talked about ethics and egos and exit strategies and um, a lot about money, yes. Um, but some very human things too. So we talked about understanding stakeholders and their needs. Uh, we talked about evolving your company with relevance, implications of failure. That was a big one. Um, challenging uh, existing paradigms, personalities, and power dynamics. 
Um, I guess my point here is that you don't have to have a business degree to think like a business person, um, but you should probably um, start just by caring about the outcomes of the business that you're working for and have some compassion for the complexity of the systems. Um, you don't really even have to care about the money side of things. Um, although at some point, if you're sort of making business decisions, you kind of have to, and you might not be able to ignore that. Um, so this presentation is about research and qualitative research and the researcher. So when we talk about research from a business sense, we usually think about some kind of an output. Um, in qualitative research, this can be the uh, take the form of something like a findings report that has data and insights. The researcher, on the other hand, is a human being um, or could be a team of human people, if you're lucky at your organization, um, that conducts that research. And depending on the maturity of the organization, a company may have researchers who are formally trained on specific methods. Some companies might just assign somebody with a really inquisitive mind to do some discovery, and that's also research, right? Um, either way, the researchers typically bring a specific set of skills that help them collect and analyze and understand data and then synthesize that data into some information that it can be acted on by a decision maker. And the reason I'm calling this out is because both of these things have value, the research and the researcher, um, but both can also be undervalued um, in a business context or by business leaders. And I'm gonna spend a lot of this presentation talking about arguing that the researcher is just as much of a value as a bit, or just as much of a business asset as the outputs that they produce. Okay, so back to our like business decision maker. Uh, this might be a stakeholder or a group of stakeholders that needs to make some kind of strategic decision about the company's direction. A person is very likely balancing a bunch of different priorities that probably all center around some kind of big financial implication for the company. And without getting too philosophical here or imposing any kind of moral judgments on that person or their values, you can understand, especially if you're a researcher, that they might have a different mental model than you do. Um, their values and skills and capabilities probably serve an entirely different function or purpose in the organization. And they probably have a bunch of factors that can influence their decision, a bunch of outside factors. And those may or may not be in the purview of the researcher. But let's say this business decision maker needs some accurate and trustworthy information or data, and they need it, uh, they'll probably say they need it immediately because that's how these things work. Um, but that's where your research comes in, right? That person relies on you and your decision or your and your research to aid in their decision making. And presuming your research is objective and it's factually accurate and it's presented in a really digestible way. Your value actually lies in helping the company achieve its broader goals through one of these decision makers. This is probably extremely oversimplified, and I really hope it's not patronizing. Um, you guys probably already know this stuff, um, but decision outcomes are really complicated, and this is not the presentation where I'm going to critique corporate hierarchies or ethics or our capitalist system. Um, I really just wanted to give you a sense of understanding where research fits in the broader business sense. And I've noticed a lot of UX researchers, especially qualitative researchers, start to kind of undervalue their own work products. And maybe a previous business decision didn't quite go your way or a decision maker didn't read or understand or have access to your research. Um, that stuff can be pretty emotional, but it doesn't diminish your value as a researcher. And when you can approach your researcher from this place of understanding its role at an organizational level, your own ability to affect change can shift and maybe help you become one of those business decision makers if that's even something you want to do. Okay, so I want to recap a little bit. This may be a refresher for some of you, but I often find myself in conversations with business stakeholders explaining the difference or significance between quant and qual research. And you guys probably know this, but the question isn't which is better. Um, both methods complement each other and seek to answer different questions and solve different problems. And this is the kind of thing that if you're talking to a business stakeholder, you might be able to arm yourself with um, when they start to ask questions. So a company might choose a quant method when they're trying to um, discover patterns. So quantitative research can reveal user trends through statistical significance. And usually those methods require a really large sample size of users for those mathematical formulas to work and provide valid data. 
So a company might want to know how many users are interacting with certain parts of their website or what percentage of people clicked through a certain part of the navigation. They might use optimal sort, which is a great tool. Um, I use that a lot for qualitative or for quantitative research. Um, and the card sorting feature might help them uncover some of those things in the navigation. And those things, those quantitative things are really valuable to know. Uh, qualitative research, on the other hand, seeks to answer why these things are happening. So if quant research showed that 100 people couldn't access uh, a certain section of the website, uh, qualitative research might at, um, be able to answer, was there a technical glitch or did they even understand the terms that they were clicking? Maybe they were clicking cutlery when they were looking for silverware. Um, or maybe there was some sort of accessibility like the font was too small um, or some kind of other issue. Uh, qualitative research usually involves some interviews and behavioral analysis, and it usually has small sample sizes. So um, once five people have uncovered a problem, you might need, not need to interview 30 more to know that that problem exists. The key here is that neither method tells the whole story on its own. You're not going to get anywhere if you start to pit re these research methodologies against each other. And you might even, your business stakeholders might start to devalue the research as a whole. Um, the, real, the real key is that quantitative and qualitative is ideal for discovery. So in information science, there are kind of many versions of this data information knowledge wisdom pyramid. Um, for simplicity, I like to use this, this pyramid for business stakeholders. Um, in some versions, the terms are slightly different or they're in slightly different order, um, or some academics even like to think about this as a continuum. But the basic premise is that these are some of the qualitative terms that we can use to describe the information that influences our ability to understand something and the degree and the credibility that can help transfer that information to other people. So qualitative research can help us uncover this kind of semantic information. And I have a really fun example. So a piece of data might be that my daughter doesn't like tomatoes. She loathes them, she hates them. Um, a piece of information might be that many kinds of tomatoes or many kinds of fruits go in fruit salads. A piece of knowledge might be, as I'm gaining context, tomatoes are classified as a botanical fruit and also as a culinary vegetable. And I can make a decision about how to use a tomato. And I probably don't want to put it in a fruit salad. So as I gain more context, I also, you know, gain more wisdom. Okay, so I have some thoughts about why business leaders might struggle with qualitative data. And the first is that um, in my experience, many leaders kind of lack familiarity with qualitative methodologies. So business people are used to seeing numbers and charts and statistics that provide some really clear and measurable results. Qualitative data is, also, is often presented as narratives or behaviors, and those exist within a specific context. And this can feel a little subjective for people who spend a lot of their time dealing with numbers and ratios. Sometimes um, your business stakeholders might even ask for quant data like from a qualitative study in which they're not going to get the results that they want, and it's just going to um, kind of cause a mess of a conversation. Another reason I think that um, business leaders might struggle with qualitative data is this idea that it's not as rigorous or that there are some issues with the sample size. Um, typically, the methods that you might use for qualitative uh, research are interviews, and sometimes that can seem like it's anecdotal. You shouldn't have to constantly defend or explain um, the rigor of your research, but I do find it's helpful to get some advanced buy-in on the research plan and discuss any of those misperceptions with your stakeholders in advance. Um, that usually can kind of help with this, um, this piece of it. The other piece of why they might struggle is that human insights are really complex. And I can't tell you how many times in business school I had to really debunk this argument that quant data is more, it leads to more direct decision making. Like we need the numbers so we can make an accurate decision. Um, to which I usually have to remind them that if they know the why that they can work toward a solution. Um, qualitative findings can be seen as kind of less straightforward because human beings 
uh, are less straightforward. And usually those results come in terms of behaviors and emotions and stories. Um, and that just makes it more difficult for people to kind of wrap their heads around. Um, I say once the research is handed off to your stakeholders, one of the things that I like to do is to guide those stakeholders on how to speak about the findings themselves and make sure that they can understand and translate it to others who are also involved in that business decision. Um, it's it's often a lot of gentle reminders that if if they know why, if they know the answer to the why, they can work toward solving a, the problem. And the last reason I think that business leaders struggle with qualitative research is this idea of time and resource constraints. And I think both quant and qual research experience this kind of bias from business stakeholders. And the truth of the matter is that good research takes time and money and it's a good investment. Um, but based on those other kind of three struggles that they have, I think qualitative research is kind of subject to this extra layer of scrutiny for time and resources. Um, and unfortunately leads qualitative researchers to kind of have to continue to defend um, their their place um, for that. So uh, that's just a little bit unfortunate. Um, and I, I don't have a, a direct solution for that. Um, but one of my, um, as I was preparing for this talk, one of the ideas I came up with was this idea of what adds value and what has values. And I came up with this idea um, from this book by, called This Could Be Our Future, A Manifesto for a More Generous World by the CEO and founder of Kickstarter. Um, I read this book during the pandemic and it was amazing. It kind of changed the way I viewed um, business and, uh, and value. Um, Strickler spends a good chunk of his book talking about the difference between something having value versus someone having values. Um, and if you're at all familiar with Kickstarter, you know it's a values-based platform, but it does create real monetary value for the creative people who use it to pursue their projects. It's pretty cool. Um, I think we try our hardest to measure value and we see it as objective. And we often think about values as more subjective because they're tied to these individual or collective beliefs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So we use the word value. We talk about something having value um, when we talk about the importance or the worst uh, or the usefulness of something or in the business sense, the profitability of something. So we might say something like um, one value of research is that it can aid in decision making. So research has value. We might also say um, or a business might say we value our researchers because they can think really critically. So researchers have or researchers are valuable. Um, we also might say a company's market value is $65 million, which means that companies can be valuable, right? They can have value. But this other word that Yancey Strickler kind of talks about is values plural. And that's about the set of principles or standards of behavior that guide our actions and our decisions. So we might say something like the accounting team values accuracy in their budgets, Business leaders have values, right? The CEO values resilience. That's one of their values. We might also think about common values that unite the people of the same discipline. So for researchers, we might say qualitative researchers have values of empathy, honesty, and connection, right? These researchers, the people have values. And we might also say things like, um, our research team acts on their values by practicing and minimizing, uh, practicing minimizing bias in their research. Um, and lastly, we might discuss this kind of bigger collective set of values that an organization tries to adopt. So for example, on his website, Kickstarter says that their corporate values include things like community and transparency. So companies can also have these collective values. And here is my pep talk for uplifting researchers and appreciating some of those like soft skills that they bring to the business table. Many of these values are valuable and they are what draw researchers to actually do the research in the first place. And you can be certain that these values have actual positive and tangible effects on the research outputs. They're also what make researchers incredible, incredibly valuable to the company. I think we need more business leaders with these values at the decision-making table. So there's this idea of values congruence, and that's the degree to which a person's values align with the values of their team or their organization or their work environment. 
And it's based on this idea that people work better with others who share similar values. And I know we're divided these days around political beliefs and religious beliefs. So I, I really don't want this slide to be taken out of context. This is more about uniting around kind of these human character values. Um, but this idea of values congruence can increase communication and trust, reduce stress and anxiety, and lead to job satisfaction across hierarchies, departments, and business units. There are many, many case studies that companies that prioritize thinking about their values in this way make better decisions that are more ethical, and they also have increased profit metrics. And I wish I had been able to pull a specific example. Um, I kind of threw this together, this slide in here last minute, but um, there are tangible examples about this. And as a researcher, if you can find one or two of your values for that align with your business stakeholder, you'll both feel more appreciated and be more willing to collaborate with each other and hopefully work toward positive outcomes for you and for your company. Um, so I'm gonna leave you kind of with this and with this last quote that I love. It says, ambiguous facts have always been fascinating to me. They always seem to be located at the intersections of where the real nature of things may be revealed. Um, and that's by an artist that I love, uh, John Dubuffet. I also put some credits and references and I'll send this deck out. The Nielsen Norman Group is my go-to um, place for kind of arming myself with ways to talk about quant versus qualitative research. Um, Erica Hall is a, an amazing researcher. She published a book called Just Enough Research. And then I also included um, a link to the book um, by Yancey Strickler, the CEO of Kickstarter. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. Awesome, thank you so much. I also included um, a link to the book that I um, Googled in the chat um, for oh, people great. To, to browse right away. Um, if anyone has any burning questions, um, I invite you to either raise your hand and ask them yourself, um, or you can um, type them into the chat and I'm happy to read them on your behalf. Um, as people are kind of noodling on what their question might be, if there is any, um, I was hoping, Jennifer, I could talk to you about some of your case studies. Um, as a uh, large water bottle enthusiast, um, I'm wondering what work you did with Yeti. Yeah, we did some really cool work with Yeti. So we did um, we did a company valuation with Yeti where we basically had to learn about which different business products or which different products were kind of affecting the bottom line. Um, and so we learned that like certain water bottles or certain coffee mugs um, were uh, more kind of valuable, but that, you know, yeah, we did, we did a bunch of interesting stuff with Yeti. The other piece that we worked on with Yeti was like, we talked a lot about patents and patents only last for like six to eight years or Yeti could only procure patents for six to eight years. So they were in kind of a time crunch to, in order to like produce certain amounts of water bottles before other companies like Arctic or competitors could kind of scoop up those patents and sort of diminish the value of the Yeti cups uh, in the market, which was really super fascinating. Um, Yeti also was at the time, this was four or five years ago, was interested in potentially pursuing like insulated dog bowls. And they kind of scrapped that or our group decided that they should scrap that idea um, because we sort of did some research that determined that people didn't really want that for their pets. Um, <laughs> I feel like you probably only so it, was, it was really fun. Yeti was very fun to work on. Yeah, I feel like you'd only need an insulated dog bowl, um, perhaps like in the peak of summer in the Midwest during a heat wave with some ice cubes if your dog lives outside, maybe. Um, no, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have had a question pop in in the chat. Um, can you elaborate on the context pyramid example a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Yeah. Let me go back to this. Uh, give me what slide is this? As uh, Jennifer is navigating through her her slides, um, I'm going to post a few additional resources in the chat. Um, where you can view um, past talks that we've had, register for our next section, and um, uh, connect with Jennifer herself on LinkedIn. Yeah. So um, this is really about um, how different people view different pieces of data, or what what is considered data, and what is considered, and how that moves up the pyramid in terms of like. So when you add context you kind of add layers to your understanding of a piece of information, right? It becomes, something might start as data 
And as you get more context, you might move up this sort of information layer until what piece of data you have evolves or morphs into um, a piece of wisdom that can be used for decision making. And this is, is really um, a little bit of a squishy idea. Um, and like I said, academics kind of go round and round about these terms, which is why I think this kind of goes back to my idea about qualitative research in general. Um, it is harder and a little bit harder to um, pin down, right? Like what is a piece of data versus what is a piece of information and how do you make that translatable to a, a stakeholder who's going to act on it, right? Um, in theory, you know, this is all qualitative, um, but if you can find some examples at, to support it, that is, um, it should be kind of helpful. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. I think so. Um, yeah. Um, perhaps maybe there's a, an additional example or how you've kind of used this pyramid in one of your, um, in some of your research. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a really good example. Um, I don't really have a good example right off the top of my head at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I found it very uh, amusing about the tomato and your daughter. Um, oh yeah, she yeah. she really does not like tomatoes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I know I, I understand like the more context. Well, you have this example seems great. kind of conventional because we all kind of know that this is um we all kind of know inherently that tomatoes don't belong in fruit salads, but like the process of getting to that actually might go through a several iterations of, um discover you might have to go through discovery if you had no context for what a tomato is right in order to arrive at this this uh wise concept that tomatoes don't belong in fruit salads if you had no context for what a tomato was and you didn't grow up eating them or you didn't understand what it was it might take you several layers of of or several iterations of qualitative understanding to actually arrive at that conclusion no, I, I get that. And especially if you view it in terms of like perhaps a strawberry where it's red, it's seed, it has seeds and it is a fruit, then mm -hmm. you would equate them to be the same thing. But the flavor profile and, and how we use them in, in society and in culinary uses um, is quite different. So yeah, yeah I think that helped um, uh, Caesar with that. Um, any other questions from the, the wider audience? Um. With that, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, Jennifer, I'll probably um, wrap us up a little bit and give everyone some time back in their day. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you everybody for listening and uh, hope you learned something. Awesome. Um, yeah, I invite everyone to, to use the links that I've posted um, and register for our next session. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to join us. And thank you to Jennifer for, for an enlightening um, presentation.